started looking at this that very many people had a handle even onto what it was. It was so big and so enormous that it's only now becoming more clearly understood. But just as we are on the cusp of understanding, we don't have the time or the luxury to spend any more time with, with only doing that. We now have to spend our time and our energy and our mental effort and our, and our moral commitment to making a difference towards solving problems. And I think that is the key to the future of food in the world. It's making the commitment to solve the problems. The problems, I think, are soluble. The answers lie in your hands. Literally, the answers lie in your hands. It's out of your hands and the hands of everyone put together uh, that we can begin to solve these problems. They're not going to be solved by the typical means. They will not be solved in anybody's lifetimes here by the typical means. It will require a new level of commitment and, honestly, a new level of sacrifice to do so. And the question is, what are we ready to do? What are our, what are our commitments? How is that going to work? How are we going to each individually, each family, each community, each religious institution, each, each of all the different institutions that we belong to, each nation, each city, whatever, all of them put together are going to have to work on this. Uh, and I would argue from a scientific perspective, it will be to our enormous benefit of all It'll be, it won't be just saving people. It will literally be making a much better world out of the world we live in. So it's going to take a great deal of, of insight to, to get us to that point. But I think that those are achievable goals. Uh, it may not happen in my lifetime, but I hope it will happen some of your lifetimes in here that we're going to make a huge difference. And I look forward to working with all of you this week to creating that opportunity. So I have some slides here. I'd like to start right off. Let's see. Um, I have also, let me just say one other thing that I just realized I set up on my screen that I wanted you to be aware of. Um, in doing this, there were people that we would have loved to have had with us and who would have loved to be here also to address us. But the fact is, is that they couldn't all be here, but many of them decided to, to do short interviews. And the interviews are here and to be seen, and we have these video interviews of different people who wanted to be, and for tonight, to, as part of introducing this, that one of those people uh, is a very well-known environmentalist himself, in fact, is highly identified with him. Started much of the concern about the environmental movement in the United States and maybe and one of the environmental leaders of the world uh, as Bill McKinnon. Uh, and Bill uh, wanted to be with us and wanted to be with us so much that he stopped to make a video specifically for us tonight that I'll show at the end of my talk. So I'm hoping that that means I have to get through on time as uh, so in order to do it. So Bill, uh, and all of you will tell Bill that I wasn't, so I better get going. Um, okay, so let's see if I can now get this uh, working. Um, I see I'm on a screen that's a little different. You know, like anything else, the moment you go on the screen and plug in, you're on a different... Uh, Screen? No, it isn't on the screen. Does anybody know how to get this onto the screen? Any of the uh, uh, um, people here from Silver Bay? Because it's set up for the screen on my end. Is the projector off? The projector's not going to turn on? Okay, let's try that. I think this is... Oh, okay. Good, thanks. We need a good idea. Is it now power on? Is there a remote up there on your podium? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Let's just see. It's in your hands then. Okay. <laughs> the answers are in your hands. It's not powered up. So. 
There's, there's no power on the uh, thing, and this remote is just for changing the slides. It should be an on button. Probably has an on button remote. All right, I'll try that one. Yes, it did. And who like Oh, that's the power. Thank you very much. Thanks. See, we have very good speakers. That proves how good the speakers are. <laughs> uh, so we're going to make you an honorary member of Iris right now. <laughs> um, okay.
We have to make food security, safety, and nourishment, and sustainability the first priority. It's hard for me to tell you what first priority is, but let me just say this. If it was truly the first priority that all of us had, there wouldn't be a problem. Primarily, the problem in the world today, since more than half of the world now lives in cities and urban environments, is a barrier to getting food. And the barrier is called how much. It's a price barrier. It's actually, literally, the amount of money you have to be able to pay for the food that you want to eat. The food is there. You just can't pay enough to get it. So we're not out of food, we're out of money. And the question is, why are we out of money for food? Is it just poverty, or is there much more to it? And today, when I was looking at my slides and trying to weed them out, I suddenly realized there was a grain of truth that went through all the things that really interested me personally in the work I was doing sorting these slides. And the thing that interested me personally is my sense that the things, that the topic areas that I wanted to emphasize all involve food injustice. Food injustice. What we want is food justice. What we see is food injustice. And what we need to do is to bring them much into much better balance in our lives and everybody's life that we influence. And that's what making food a first priority is all about. So we want to do something special with all what we have. Here are the problems that I see. I mean, there are others too, I suppose. But this is, this is the summary of all of them. I can't deal with all of these tonight. These are enormous numbers, but I'm going to deal with a lot of them if I can get uh, through them all. So I'm going to go pretty quickly, but not quickly enough to lose you. So it's climate change, uh, population growth, the globalization process of, of commoditization of food, of the commoditization, or really the globalization of agriculture, sustainability of what the practices are out there. Can they work in the future? Or are they just something that's going to be glued together for making an extra buck right now? Um, the increased use of grains for animal and, and eating animal products. Can we learn to eat down the food chain? Can we learn to do that? Is it going to make that much difference? I grew up, look, I grew up in the, with food stamps in the Second World War. Uh, I can remember as a child that uh, literally I was, you know, we had a stamp book and, and, if, and we got meat once a week. That was it. And we were very happy having that. I didn't have an unhappy childhood. I, as far as I'm concerned, I had a very happy childhood. And I lived on a farm. I lived on a farm, so I brought up on a farm. So, and we didn't have meat either, is my point. Uh, energy and carbon and, and agricultural footprints. We can't just think about all the transportation, all the cars and all the other things, and the electricity we're using, etc., and planes we're riding in. We also have to think about what agriculture is doing and whether the agricultural practices, what we, what's the size of their footprint too. Genetically modified foods and biotechnology is a key part of this whole question. Um, pro and con, lots of it. Uh, a colleague from the UK it also has agreed to, uh, uh, Sir Brian Heath has agreed to, and he sent a, a we have a, uh, a video piece from him as well. And Brian is also kind enough to have sent us 50 copies of a book he just did. And so I have 50 copies of those who think they would like to have a, a copy of this book uh, about uh, food in Africa today. Um, food to fuel, ethanol in the world. That's a really important one. That's going to be something I'm going to talk a lot about tonight. Land grants. I would like to talk more about land grants and what they mean. And I, as I say, it's a symptom of the future, and a symptom of the future cause of food problems. It certainly is. Uh, and we'll get to that, I hope. Uh, and if not, we will certainly get to it this week. Food sovereignty and social unrest. Food sovereignty. In 2006 to 2008, really 2007 to 2008, we had a world food crisis. That was the beginning of this whole thing. The fact of the matter is, at that point in time, countries were existing pretty much as they had for many years. 
And suddenly, there really wasn't enough food. or it appeared to not have enough food to go around. And suddenly, people didn't have food. And there was going to be a very serious problem. So there was a shortage, what seemed to be a shortage. It turns out it was much more complicated than that. But there were shortages of various kinds that were very real to some of the people in the world. And they starved. Literally, people starved at this time. So the question is, um, uh, what happened? And one of the things that's happened, one of the good things that's happened, is, is every country that imported food decided, gee, we cannot depend upon the food chain that's used to supply us through the global networks anymore. Um, so there were things that happened that made everybody decide they were going to go in a different direction. And one of the things that happened, the bad, that's the bad in some respects, but the good thing that happened was that people who've been wanting, who've been talking about food sovereignty for a very long time, the whole food sovereignty movement for the indigenous people of the world, and they number well over a billion people, they suddenly got a voice, and now they're getting this huge voice of the United Nations, and it's a very exciting time for their recognition. And so uh, we hope to deal much more with that theme as well. So I'd say indigenous, and then also the gender issues with regard to food, and the, and the rights of women to raise food, the rights of women who are, who are providing a tremendous amount of the diets in the poorest communities of the world are not receiving any kind of equality, and we need to balance that and recognize that and deal with it. And food waste. So this is field to fork and beyond, because there's other kinds of waste that occur that we don't even think about as waste, um, but is waste, in fact. If we eat foods that we can't metabolize, and that's wasting them in some respects. We don't even know. Many people walk around with all kinds of food sensitivities they don't even know about until they encounter the food. But the important point, though, is there's an enormous amount of waste occurring. And there's an enormous amount of waste, an enormous amount, that all of us, each and every one of us in this room, can deal with. So there's a takeaway that we hope will develop over the week. And then there's this whole question of nutrient safety, the whole question of what is the safety of our food supply. Every day, we're, we're questioning that in different ways. What is the new micronutrient content? We have all been brought to think about just the food labels as they exist. But the fact of the matter is they do not describe all the things that are there that need to be there and need to be understood. And we need to be able to educate. We need to be able to support the education of people to know more than they know right now. And by knowing more, we believe that in the end, that's going to make an enormous difference on behavior and action. And we can see that all around us. There's a huge change. There's a sea change going on uh, related to what uh, uh, Michelle Obama has been doing in the White House with, in the United States with children. Uh, and her uh, attempts at really making a difference. So there is also the question of stunting and obesity and their connections and their interconnections. And we'll be talking about those tomorrow night. So that's some of the things. Let me go right into this. Water. We've dealt with water in the past, but let me just say three things about it. First, fresh water only, there's only about 3% of the world's water is fresh water. About, and of that, only, uh, literally, only three tenths of that water, that is uh, literally three tenths of 1% of that water, is surface water, like behind us in the Lake George. Uh, and even a very tiny percentage of that is 2% of that water are in the rivers of the world, and it's the rivers of the world that provide most of the irrigation that we're talking about. So most of the food is raised in river deltas, they're raised from irrigation through rivers, along the, the banks of rivers, et cetera, traditionally. So we have a, an amazing variation with respect to water. That's really important. Look at the water that's used in, in, in the raising of, of, of crops. Humans on the bottom, we use about four liters. Some of us, I, I'm sure I drank five liters already today, but at least it feels that way because I've been all running around here. But we're all getting aside, about four liters a day, but look at a crop. These are crops uh, used for the human, food for human daily use compared to the crops we eat. Okay, for, so the crops we eat, a uh, low level of crops, some crops don't require a lot of irrigation, only use about 2,000 liters. Others, like corn, use close to 5,000 or the full 5,000 liters. 
So some crops use a lot of water, others do not. So what about the use of it? The two things that you should be aware of, first on the left side of this, I'm sorry, on your right side, um, is the hectares under irrigation. If you look, the, uh, if you can read the bottom access, this started up in, in, in really in between, right, right around 1940 or so, 1945, right after the Second World War, irrigation started to become common. And it accelerated, and it has accelerated today. And on the right side, uh, I'm sorry, on your left side, you'll see the number of, of countries that are using irrigation and the degree to which they're using it. And so um, uh, Pakistan and China are very heavy users of irrigation. 